Um, just a show of hands, who's not from Iowa? Oh, wow. Okay. Pretty good. Uh, well, welcome to Iowa. And, you know, I'm going to talk about you know, what are the alternatives to prednisone. And uh, I've heard that questions have been held at the end of the talk, but what I will do is maybe allow a couple of questions between each section, because I'll be moving from one group of drugs to the next. But all, at the end, we'll still allow uh, more questions at the end. And I heard Kelly typically moderates things, so I'll leave it up to her. All right, so <clears throat> what are the therapies for sarcoidosis? And you know, the way I look at it, and it's my own way of discussing it and explaining it to patients, is you know, I view them as Typically three baskets, and we'll talk about basket number four when we get to it. But basket one, number one is prednisone, which is what we're trying to move away from. Number two is what we call steroid sparing agents, and some of these may be familiar to you guys, methotrexate, microphenolate, azathioprine, lefunamide, and I put them in the same basket because I think they're all more or less the same. They work in similar me uh, mechanisms of action. Slightly different side effect profile, but to me, I think they're all more or less interchangeable, just with different side effect profiles. And then basket number three, you've got the biological agents, uh, infliximab and adalimumab, maybe the most ones that you hear about, and then the last one, which we don't use on a regular basis, just because the evidence is not strong, is rituximab. And then basket number four is the others that don't fit in the other three baskets, hydroxychloroquine, Plaquenil, some of you may know it as, topical agents, and then we'll talk about research studies a little bit. So, why are we dissing corticosteroids? Uh, pros, it's fast acting, it gets things better quickly. If you're having major issues, if you're having what I call critical or fragile organ involvement, uh, prednisone is a way to fix it quickly. Critical organs, are the ones that you can't tolerate losing even one or two percent of its function. And to me, those are eyes, brain, and heart. Any little bit of loss of function in any of those can make a huge difference on the quality of life. So you want those fixed quickly and you want it reversed quickly. Uh, we do know it's very effective. Um, most patients above a dose of 10 milligrams a day, prednisone will have an effect for them, and it's relatively cheap compared to all the other options. <coughs> Why we take it? Well, it's a never-ending side effect profile, and I say the side effects are guaranteed. If you take enough prednisone for a long time enough, you will get a lot of the side effects. So it's never, for, uh, for me and um, our group, it is never a long-term choice of therapy for sarcoidosis. We never have anybody on it. Uh, for beyond six months as a long-term management. Uh, we try to get people off of it. Uh, we hate it as much as you guys hate it, but we have to use it in, in some situations to salvage uh, organs and prevent further damage. And I did talk about this. It's fragile organ involvement, eyes, brains, and heart. You, you need quick relief of symptoms. The only one that can work is prednisone. <laughs> you need quick reversible organ dysfunction, and it should not be used for long-term management of sarcoidosis. So, that moves us into, well, if you need to be treated, then what is the other options that the patients have or you guys have? And these are steroid-sparing agents, and they're called steroid-sparing because their, their use is meant to replace prednisone. They're used to uh, they're good for long-term management of the disease. Uh, overall, well tolerated. Some patients have reactions to it, so, but the majority of patients do tolerate it. Some patients have early reactions to it. You can stop it, and I would say over half people who get re-challenged with it do okay with it. Or you can manipulate the drug, how you take it, how, when you take it, and the side effects can be tolerable. <coughs> And the key thing here, it has potential side effects compared to prednisone, which has more or less guaranteed side effects. Meaning some patients will have side effects, but I think the majority do okay on it. 
what's wrong with these drugs and why don't we just use them off the bat and ignore prednisone? Well, one thing is they're slow to start working. Some of these drugs can take four to six months before they take effect, if not longer, in some patients. Uh, and not everybody responds to it. In general, rough guideline, I say 60% of people respond to the most common agent we use is methotrexate, um, but about 40% don't. And the problem is you have to take this drug for beyond that four to six months timeline before you can figure out whether it's working for you or not. So you could be popping these pills for six to nine months and then you come and we tell you it's not working and now we have to find something different. And, and it has some potential side effects. In some patients, these are mild, some of them are significant, and then we have to go to something else. But <clears throat> typically they are our two go-to drug. When should we use, again, these are general guidelines. They're not written somewhere in hard print that we have to all follow it. Uh, and amongst different doctors, there's different interpretations and styles of practice on how they use it. So just because I say this is the way I use it doesn't mean this is based on guidelines that are very rigorous and strong research behind it. But in, typically anybody who the physician feels that it's going to need long-term therapy. And for me, anything beyond six months is considered to be long-term therapy. Uh, we do need to recognize it is slow to act. So you're not going to take it for two weeks a month and start to feel better. So in certain situations when you need the disease to be reversed or suppressed quickly, this is not a choice. That's where you do prednisone and maybe one of these drugs some, some physicians will try prednisone first, taper it off, and if the disease re-emerges or comes back, then they'll do a steroid sparing agent. Both approaches are equally correct as long as you watch the disease and figure out what your disease is going to do. It has some potential side effects, so you need to know what those side effects are, realize what they are, uh, and some of these side effects can be reversed. Uh, with the way you take the drug and a different formulation of the drug. Instead of pills, you can take shots for it. Um, and some patients don't mind the side effects if they're pretty mild, and some patients just can't do it anymore and they're done with it. And how long you take this drug for? Well, I mean, as 10 of us, you most likely will get 12 different answers. So, to me, in general, it depends on, are you responding to it? Are you getting better to it? Uh, how fast are you getting better to, on these drugs? Which organ is involved? Which may make a difference on how long we treat you. Again, I mean, skin rash in a non-exposed area, you know, you may want to do a shorter uh, duration and then you can withdraw it and if it comes back, then you go back on drug. When you're talking about brain involvement, eye involvement, and heart involvement, I typically are I'm less likely to withdraw the drug just because, again, they're critical, fragile organs. So I'm a bit more shy in taking away the drug than, let's say, skin or lung involvement. <clears throat> now, the most common drug we use in general is methotrexate. And this is not based because it's better than anything else. It's based on a few decades of use in the sarcoidosis uh, community. We have a lot of knowledge about it, experience with it. Uh, it's most, if you look at what's published out there, it's based on methotrexate. But again, it's not the fact that it's better than leflutamide or better than mycophenolate or is a thiopril in general. It's what we know, it's what we've used, so we're very familiar with it. Um, the, as I said, the others are more or less equally effective. And we've had patients we've used methotrexate on, they didn't respond. We switched them to one of the other agents in, those, in, those, in that basket, and they responded to it and felt better. Um, physicians in other centers may prefer some other drug in that basket as their first choice after prednisone, and they see the similar responses based on their own experience and also what they published. So if your doctor chooses one of the other agents and not methotrexate, I wouldn't be too alarmed about it. Um, you know, they're all potentially useful agents in sarcoidosis. 
<clears throat> the key thing to remember is that they all suppress the immune system to some degree. So it's not like any of them works in a magical way compared to the other ones. Sarcoidosis is an immune, an overactive immune response that causes these granulomas that you heard about, and they need to be suppressed. And all the drugs suppress the immune system in one way or the other. Uh, and most of them, if not all of them, still need some blood work to watch for potential side effects and toxicity from it. So and there's not one drug that you can get away with that versus others you need it. Okay. So in general, your physician is most likely going to choose the drug that they're most comfortable with, that they're u most used to it. And also, what other conditions that you have, liver disease, kidney disease, uh, heart disease, may impact which one they choose. So I can, we can take a pause there and if anybody has any questions about these drugs, uh, we don't want to linger too long here, but again, at the end, if you still have more questions about this topic, uh, you know, we can come back to it. I'm going to, I'm, <coughs> I've been on the cell set. My convoy? <laughs> yeah, uh, Seven Yes, 750 milligrams a day for about uh, 10 months at this point. Uh, it seems to be working pretty well for neurosarcoid. Okay. Uh, but I associate uh, an overheating in my body. It seems to be, you know, I go outside in cold weather with a t-shirt on in the summertime, working outside, I'm just covered with sweat all the time uh, as a side effect. Is, is there should I expect that to go away, get used to it, or, or what? what it, it is not one of the common side effects related to mycophenolate. Uh, and you have to wonder whether it's the effect of mycophenolate or something else related to sarcoidosis going on or a completely different process. So what you're describing is heat intolerance, okay? Where you feel warm, where everybody around you feels cold. Common things are thyroid function. So if you know, somebody complains to me that they feel more warm, hot compared to everybody else, I mean, I'm, I'm more likely to check their thyroid function first to see if that's working fine or not. Um, you know, we see in sarcoidosis autonomic dysfunction, where some patients have a problem regulating body temperature. Uh, they have, you know, they can, they feel cold, too cold, too warm or cycle between it, they sometimes sweat more than they should, feel flushed. Uh, so the question is, could this be a manifestation of it as part of sarcoidosis or other etiologies? I mean, neuropathy can be from prednisone, that's on from diabetes. Um, so other etiologies, other than your drug or your sarcoidosis, may be causing some of these new symptoms. Okay. Now, I've not seen a patient yet who's on mycophenolate who's complained something like this, but I don't use mycophenolate as my first choice. I may have a handful of patients on it, but not a lot. So it's not like I have 100 patients on it, and I can tell you I've never seen it. But if you look, the pamphlet is not one of those things. So I would recommend is talking to your doctor about, here's my symptoms. They'll probe whether there are any other symptoms uh, that are related to autonomic dysfunction or related to thyroid function and, and then do some workup to check whether some other possible cause is causing it. Sometimes what you have to do is maybe, if it's safe, especially with neuro, to stop the drug, see if this reaction goes away, re-challenge yourself, see if it comes back, but again, you have to talk to your doctor about, especially with neurosarcoidosis, um, you know, should you, should you change your drug, stop it or not? Okay, I mean, if you're taking it for a skin rash, for skin sarcoidosis, that's on your legs, that's easy, you can stop it. If the rash gets a little bit worse, it's not you know, life-threatening. Stopping it when you have neurosarcoidosis could be detrimental. Okay, so you need to discuss the symptoms with your doctor and do a little bit of workup. Okay? Thank you. Hi there. I was wondering, um if you might discuss some alternative therapies, if you found any that might work for patients with sarcoidosis, and also to, pardon me, if you've seen any similarity or if there's any in the literature about um, 
as it relates to patients with fibromyalgia and sarcoidosis in terms of symptoms? Have you seen that? But yes. <coughs> so just to clarify, alternative therapies meaning non-prescription non medications. Prescription. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I mean, as you guys know, sarcoidosis is a very diverse disease. All right, with numerous manifestations. Um, so right now, in your what I consider to be your classical, straightforward sarcoidosis, lung involvement that's causing problems, symptoms, or getting worse from one visit to the other, eye involvement, brain involvement, so a straightforward, direct organ involvement that's causing dysfunction. <clears throat> I would be very cautious about using alternative therapies, just because we don't know whether they will work or not. So if somebody's trying alternative therapies as their primary treatment for their lung disease or their eye disease, without proven effectiveness, you're maybe risking worsening of lung disease. Now, when it comes to the fatigue, the fibromyalgia-like symptoms, the aches and pains, um, that's really a big black box even for us, okay? And we still don't completely understand it, although you know a bunch of us are trying to better understand it. And in that case, we do know straightforward medications, you know, prednisone, methotrexate, these things, from our experience, they don't help fibromyalgia-like symptoms, they don't help fatigue for the majority of patients. So then, talking to your doctor, you know, if you want to try some other alternative methods, you know, it should be okay, but as long as you talk to your doctor about what are those alternative methods. Because just because they're sold as alternative or natural doesn't mean automatically mean they're safe. Okay? <clears throat> Things that I've seen patients do is modify their diet. Follow a gluten-free diet or go vegetarian. Right? And when my patients ask me, I say, you can try it as long as, long as you don't go overboard and, you know, just strict to, you know, to eat one class of uh, food all the time. I mean, the patient's unlikely, or you're going to unlikely hurt yourself going gluten free for a while and see if that makes a difference. But I still would do that in consultation with your doctor because you may have other medical conditions that could potentially get worse following the, some of these diets. Uh, I personally am not a big fan of supplements just because they're not regulated, and every now and then you hear about people getting hurt using supplements because there was a compound in it that was not unknown or undeclared or untested. So I typically will tell my patients, I'd rather not if you don't know what's in it. Okay. From medications wise to treat these, it's a dilemma, but then you're moving outside these classes of drugs into drugs like gabapentin, which you guys may have heard of. Uh, which are typical neuropathic medications, and they may or may not help. They may help or may not help. Okay. Again, for fibromyalgia fatigue, you need to not blame the sarcoidosis off the bat. If you look up fatigue, the list is never ending, so your doctor needs to go through different uh, possibilities, thyroid, hormonal, uh, other diseases that can cause that. Okay. All right. Um, you guys might have more questions on this uh, therapeutic modality. Um, you know, we can go back to it at the end of the talk. <clears throat> so the next step, step up in therapy is what's called biological agents. And, or you might have heard these are the infusion injectable drugs. Um, <coughs> the difference between methotrexate and the other drugs in that basket and the biological agents is the methotrexate, the mycophenolate, they more or less ramp down the whole immune system. They're not specific targeting one cell or one arm of the immune system. Whereas when you come to the biological agents, really it's a strategic hit to one uh, marker on a cell or one chemical that two cells talk with each other. Um, uh, so what we know about these drugs is they are effective. I mean, we've all used it in patients who have not responded to basket number two and we've seen patients get better on it. Um, and the good thing about some of these drugs is they can be self-administered at home. You can have it in the fridge, take out the uh, drug and because it's an injectable drug and give it to yourself. It's made like an EpiPen if you guys have seen EpiPens. Some of them are infusion drugs. 
meaning you have to go to an infusion center and get an infusion every four weeks in general, every four to six weeks. Um, I've had some patients do home infusions where, they, where a nurse comes to their house, but again, it gets complicated because insurance has to approve it and things like that. Um, the downside of these biological agents, it's a next step up in immune suppression. Again, it's still suppressing it, even though it's targeted uh, against a specific point in the immune system, uh, they still suppress the immune system. Uh, so there is some risk of infections associated with it. And they are very expensive, meaning your insurance, you're going to have a hard time getting your insurance approve it. And even if they do, your co-pays may be high. So there might be extra work uh, trying to cover the high co-pays or getting insurance to uh, approve it. So basket number two, your doctor writes a prescription, you go downstairs to the pharmacy and there's a high chance you're going to pick up the drug. Basket number three, if you're prescribed that drug, you may need to wait a handful of weeks before you actually get the drug approved and started. <coughs> okay. <coughs> So when are these drugs used? Um, in general, they're used for people with progressive disease or persistent symptoms, even though they've tried using steroid sparing agents. So somebody who's tried one or two drugs or three drugs in basket number two and are still getting worse or still progressing, uh, then your doctor might be recommending these injectable drugs. They're also slow to work. You're not gonna take the first drug and feel better or things are not gonna improve. But I, you know, I, my sense from them is they do work a little bit faster than the steroid sparing agents, but still, it's a two to four month, more likely a three to four months before patients start to notice an improvement from it. So patients get the first shot and they're not gonna be feeling much better. Some do, but not everybody. So we just need to be realistic with the expectations of it. It has some potential side effects. The biggest one is the degree of immune suppression, the risk of uh, big time infections like fungal infections, reactivation of tuberculosis if somebody's been exposed to it in the past. So the doctor has to make sure that you haven't been exposed to TB in the past or you don't live in a bad environment where you might pick up some kind of a fungal infection because it can get out of hand with these uh, drugs. Uh, even simple pneumonias, if not addressed and treated early on, may get worse on these drugs. That's true for all of the drugs, but again, you're taking higher steps of immune suppression as you go through these agents. How long you treat, again, it depends on do you respond to this drug, what kind of response you're getting from these drugs, and uh, again, what organ involvement. Some organs are less likely to stop this drug earlier compared to other organs. And they're not free of side effects. Some patients get infusion reactions. Uh, some patients we can manage those infusion reactions and some we can't. So we have to stop it. And infusion reactions is as you're getting the infusion in, you start getting fever, chills, aches and pains, may feel dizzy. <clears throat> so those are not good side effects while getting the drug infused. Um, some patients, their body produces antibodies against this drug. These drugs are foreign protein to your body and your immune system will say, this is not normal to me, this is not known to me, and they may produce antibodies that bind this drug. So every time you get the infusion, those antibodies just bind it and neutralize it. So then you lose this drug as a potential therapeutic agent. So <clears throat> we'll take a pause here on these drugs and see if anybody's got questions for them. I mean, the, the, the first indication would be you got a patient who's getting these infusions, just doing fine, maybe responding to it and getting better. Then at some point, you know, they go and get the infusion, but they lose their they they lose control of their disease even though they're getting the infusion. Okay. Now, that doesn't automatically mean that they have these antibodies. It could simply mean uh, their disease has changed, or maybe. Uh, you know, even though these drugs are used to treat sarcoidosis, there are some patients who take these drugs 
for other indications and they develop sarcoidosis. Not because of them, they have hidden sarcoidosis, but it gets worse on these drugs. I've had a couple patients who, when I gave them in, in one of these drugs, infliximab, actually their disease got worse. And by stopping the drug, it got better. But the biggest thing is you're getting the drug, you're getting feeling good, and then at some point you feel it's not working. And, and we can order an antibody level, a, a blood test, that can measure whether you, an individual has antibodies in their system, in their blood, and, and if they neutralize it. Is the blood test the ANA positive? No, the ANA positive, that's a very non-specific test that suggests that somebody may have an autoimmune disease in general. And as we get older, we're more likely to have a positive react test. That means nothing. So rheumatologists hate it because it creates a lot of referrals that mean nothing. Uh, the antibody is actually an antibody that binds the drug. So this is an antibody that does not exist in your body before you saw this drug. And after we introduce this foreign protein in your body, your immune system recognizes it and like a virus or a bacteria, creates new antibodies that are specific for this drug. And, and the lab will check the levels of these antibodies in their lab. They also check to see if these antibodies actually neutralize the function of the drug in the lab. And when we get back the report, they give us, yep, yeah, there is this much level of antibodies in the system, and yep, yeah, they do neutralize the, the, the drug in the lab. Now, the good thing about it is there is more than one kind of drug in the infliximab group, but uh, so sometimes you can switch somebody to another one, and they do fine. Sometimes they don't. We're running out of time? Yeah, we're running short on time, so we'll, we'll keep moving through the slides and have more questions about other presenters. Okay. So, I mean, we're almost at the end. Hydroxychloroquine, uh, I don't put it in a basket because it's on its own. We consider it to be the weakest one of the drugs, but not, you know, it doesn't mean it's a wimpy drug. Uh, but it's used for specific indications. Somebody has high calcium in their blood, high calcium in their urine with risk of kidney stones, they have mild skin problems. We sometimes try it for fatigue and aches and pains. It typically works, it's good, but not everybody responds to it. I wouldn't be using hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil to treat lung disease or eye disease or anything else uh, beyond these uh, indications. As I said, it's overall very safe and tolerable, although you know, every now and then somebody will have a reaction to it. So um, it's there as a first line in specific indications. Topical agents, the most common way is small skin involvement, you can use topical steroids. If you have eye sarcoidosis, then your eye doctor might use that as a first agent. And as you can see, we, we do have some options, but no, they're not great options, and we still have some gaps. So we need some new agents, some stronger agents, and some milder agents for different levels of treatment. Uh, so, you know, I wouldn't be shy at to ask about research studies that involve either, and you know, drug companies that's running a, a drug study, seeing if you can participate in, or whether your doctor or a research center close to you is trying to discover something new if you want to participate in them. Because ultimately, this kind of work may benefit you five, ten years down the road, or benefit somebody else uh, from it. And that would be the end of mine. And if there's time for... Yeah, I think we'll, we'll end it there and say thank you, Dr. Hamza, okay. for sharing your time with us. <clears throat> and I'll hang around in case anybody has a specific question about this. Small token for our appreciation.